and um, I want to um, uh, see. I'm going to share my screen and so here welcome we go to work. Monday Night Boom Zoom Gardening Pod, everybody. Session number eight. And we have most of our usual things, Q&A, uh, the weekly update. Steve has agreed to do that. And if Bill and, Ma Bill and Mary join us, they'll also do that. A few announcements. And, and um, you know, I put a, I built this Hugo Mound about five years ago. And you'll see a lot of people on YouTube and whatnot making Hugo Mounds. And mine is after five years. And it's actually sunk a lot. So uh, it's still a great planting place. You'll see it later. But I thought it would be interesting to share. So this is um, uh, Gail's question with picture. Go ahead, Gail. Um, yes, I, I bought some seed potatoes last year at Midsummer Farm and I planted them and I mound them and then I thought I dug them up. I didn't get very many because obviously I didn't dig them all up. And I was going to use this bed for something else. And then the potatoes started to grow. You can see the one in the front is really collapsing. There are flowers on some of them. And I, now that I have them, you know, I want to maintain them, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. I got this gardening book that um, I've been reading for a long time. And she talks about potatoes. And okay. one, one of the things she pointed out is, if you raise your own potatoes, you can have something that you rarely get around anywhere, and that's called new potatoes. So basically, if one of those potato plants is getting in your way, you could dig it up now. The potatoes on it will be very small, very tender, and very tasty. Okay. So if you really wanted, if, it were, if they were obstructing something else that you really wanted to grow, you could dig them up now and eat them. And if I wanted, I, I love new potatoes, but if I wanted to leave them so that they'd be bigger, how do I know when you harvest potatoes? I'm, so I'm, I, could, I could jump in on that one. Um, typically, potatoes, the, the greens of the potatoes will start dying back. And um, commercial farmers use uh, herbicides to kill off the tops and because they're working on a tighter schedule. But um, generally, it depends on the variety. You can, you can usually harvest full-grown potatoes between 75 and 90 days. Um, so it would kind of depend on the variety that you have. But as Michael said, you could almost any time, uh, I, would, I would give it another couple of weeks because it's still early in the season. But, but in a couple of weeks, stick a shovel or a, or a fork in the ground and just loosen up near one of them and see how what the potatoes look like. And if they're the size of marbles, you might want to give it a little more time. If they're si size of golf balls, that's a, like a delicious new potato time. And uh, from that point on, you could start, you could continue harvesting. Is there any poisons or anything I have to worry about with potatoes? Do I have to keep on adding soil? If the potatoes are are on the surface, if if any of the potato skins are um, at the surface or above, um, it's going to ruin the potato. They're going to get green and you should not eat them. Okay, there, so there's mounding, nothing on the surface. Well, mounding is a good idea. Um, the, the more soil you hill up, the more side shoots will come out of the actual plant uh, as roots, which turn into potatoes. So, um, yeah, the more hills, the better. But, you know, I, as I remember, from a few weeks back, you were talking about these, and these these have grown in the same spot that they were last year. And uh, it may be a little late to hill them, but you know, why not give it a try? If you can cover them with something, or even straw, if you've got straw, and you could uh, pack that in around there. The whole idea yeah. is to give give the uh, stems some coverage and allow them to put out shoots and farm little potatoes. Oh, wow! So you can put straw around them. You can, yeah. Oh. And do the potatoes grow in straw? Yeah, they will grow in there, mm -hmm. not not as not as not as well as in uh, nice loamy soil, but you can use that. You could use shredded leaves as well. Michael's got a lot of shredded leaves, I believe. 
Yeah, I, I do too, if I want. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I did ask, you have a good memory. I did ask a question um, whether they would be viable because I, they were just coming out when I asked the question yeah. and I didn't know, the, you know whether they would actually start producing, but I guess right. they... Yeah. What is the, one, just one more question. What does it mean when they flower? Some are flowering and some aren't. Uh, well, generally what it means is they're, they're going to be pollinated by pollinators and that means it's going to be good for the plant. Okay. Some of the, if, if you don't have, some, some will produce potatoes with not many flowers. You may not even see the flowers. I have three, three different rows, which I talk about in a, in a minute. Um, and two of them are in flower and one is not, but the, the third will be shortly. So, um, Generally, I like things to flower because that means the pollinators are going to get in there and, and do their work. Okay, thank you, everybody. You're welcome. Our pleasure. If you, I was gonna say, Chris told me a couple weeks ago that when they start flowering, that you can start kind of grabbing and robbing a couple of those little potatoes. And that's what I've been doing. And I have, they're, they're really cute. They're small and they are super tender. The skins are really soft and they're delicious. So you can definitely kind of steal a couple if you're in the mood. If, um, if uh, you do a lot of that healing up, um, does that extend the 75 to 90 days that you mentioned? If, yeah. For example, I heard somebody talk about, um, I I've heard people talk about like using tires. I can't imagine using, you know, old car tires as a planters, but, you know, stacking tire on tire on tire and having like 15 or 20 potatoes per tire. But I can't imagine that whole thing would grow in 90 days. I, I can't either, but I, I, I'd love to see what that looks like. All right, next. Next, we have several um, pictures from Sylvia. Sylvia, do you want to explain your pictures? Yes, yeah, so this is my first season. Um, they were like just doing amazing. They're gigantic. They're beautiful. And then two days ago, it was so drastic. Um, about six or seven leaves are looking like this. So I don't know what is the indication of. Um, I was freaking out. <laughs> I was like, no. Um, because really, the, the plant is just, I'm, I'm, vertically growing them up and they're just like green and um i water daily um i have given them a, a vegetable feed by esposa what do you think when did you give this vegetable feed if you don't mind me asking um oh actually yeah uh, two days ago, maybe I mean, maybe three 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 to four days before that. I mean, did you maybe put like a little too? Much, have you been putting too much uh, food, uh, you know, fertilizer in there? Is it is it kind of strong or uh, might be having um, a reaction to that? If you you know you could you could over fertilize things as well. Yeah, I did three tablespoons around the drip line. Huh. And it was going to rain very hard that night. So I said, let it soak up the other night when it rained really, really hard. And this was in two days. It happened so quickly. Any thoughts, anyone? Definitely looks like there was something on the leaves that affected it. What was in the previous slide? There was some reference to use of hydrogen peroxide. Is that to keep the uh, beetles down? Yeah, so I didn't know if it was a type of fungus. And I thought hydrogen peroxide being um, harmless and somewhat organic, um, I sprayed it last night with um, hydrogen peroxide. It was. Uh, I've never heard of using the hydrogen peroxide on it. No, as an uh, antifungal preventive mm -mm. for treatment. 
but but you sprayed it you, you sprayed it after it started turning this color right or before so i sprayed it last night oh okay last but night okay it yeah it didn't um make any change does that look I like fungus to, i was trying to spare the other leaves if in fact it was fungal in nature and um there's a guy named gary pally Palachik, and he uses um natural remedies um alternating um, baking soda, hydrogen peroxide, and neem oil. And he would use the same recipes um, for treatment as well. They're kind of curling too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, today they were absolutely much drier. Mm. Did you but look underneath to see if there's any bugs on them? There isn't actually. I well, I did capture two bugs, but I think they were a random find. I don't know. I, I, I've included them in the slide. Did you look I, down at the stem and see if there's any bores in there? Oh, that's a potato bug. That's not a swash bug. Okay. Hmm. Weird. Like I've never seen that. They get mildewy. They get bugs. Hmm. I would take the bad leaves off right away because you have strong leaves. Yes. And um, when all else fails, you call up Cornell because they know about every disease known to mankind. Okay. Well, maybe run across the street and ask Brendan to uh, take a look. Look at my camp. I am a little apprehensive about knocking on his door, but don't kid yourself. I've been watching. <laughs> no, yeah, no. I got to see his garden. I, I got to see his garden the other day. It's great. Oh, okay. So I'm the house right across the street. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, but I guess remove the leaves if you could. Yeah, I mean, usually, right? Squash does get a lot. Uh, zucchini stuff, I do get a lot of, you know, white mildewy stuff, but I've never seen that particular. Yeah, color. me neither. It's not mildewy, yeah, you're right. No, it's not. It's dry and brittle. Yeah, and, and the new growth on top um, is doing okay. It looks like one leaf is beginning to curl on the cucumbers, but I did cut off the lower ones because there were two cucumbers that wanted to come out and didn't, where these were adjacent to the leaf. So it's happening both in your cucumbers and in your zucchini. No, this is different from my um, zucchini. But both of them developed these problems at about the same time. Well, no, the cucumber had a rough start to begin with. These leaves kind of like weeks ago, it never changed. And um, the four lower leaves um, essentially have remained what they look like now, not any worse. Um, it was slow to grow. And then finally this cucumber popped up. Yeah rapidly as well. I would I would just jump in on the <clears throat> on the zucchini. I, I would suspect that it's a bug and I would check with Cornell. And you mentioned neem. Um, you have to be a little bit careful using neem in, in especially hot weather. It can cause burning of uh, the leaves. Mm -hmm. It's like suntan lotion, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't get there yet. Um, I just did the hydrogen peroxide. Okay. And I was going to do the baking soda tomorrow. You know, one thing with cucumber plants is they get cucumber beetles, and the beetles carry various diseases. Mm -hmm. And what you see on there might be a disease carried by the cucumber beetle. Uh, I'm not sure what to do about it, but uh, uh, I think, do you know what cucumber beetles look like? Here? No. Yeah. Little tiny, no more than a quarter of an, quarter of an inch long, and they have stripes, and they're skinny, um, but they they can be very damaging because of the different diseases that they carry. I don't think they eat as much as they carry diseases. So it's safe to consume this um, cucumber. Oh sure. Okay. Yeah, I think it's fine. Oh yeah. Hopefully it recovers, sorry. Thank you. I think it looks like a disease to me, but I'm trying to figure out what it might be. Um, 
This is the cucumber, right, or the squash? This is a cucumber. This is a cucumber. cucumber. Okay, it says, yeah, leaves with yellow patches, older leaves mottled and distorted. Mosaic. Okay. Um, so that might be that. I don't know. And what, what does it say causes that? Um, control aphids and cucumber beetles because they spread the virus. Uh, and plant, you know, resistant cult, um, cult, cultivars. So, yeah, you know, a lot of cucumbers have are resistant to mosaic, but a, a lot of them aren't. So it may be that the the beetles or the aphids carried the mosaic, and you know, there it is. Okay. If the top growth is still going fine, I I would, if it gets worse, pull off the leaf and just let mm -hmm. it, let it continue. Oh boy, here's, oh, and there's a whole bunch of other nice things it can be. <laughs> um, alternaria leaf blight. Dark brown spots with concentric rings usually appear on older leaves first. It's not concentric. It's not concentric. Mm -hmm. No, I don't know. we should see what this looks like. Ah, blah, 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 blah. Um, this will scare you if you read all this stuff. Leaves with spots, blotches, or brown areas. Angular leaf spot. Oh boy. Um, hmm. may, may, I, may I interject a question? Sylvia, if this is your first year in gardening, what kind of soil did you plant this in? I mean, what, what, what did you do to set up your beds? It is um, organic um, miracle Grow. It's a uh, four raised beds. May I ask, well, what's mosaic that you guys were referencing? The disease. It's a, a disease. It's a virus. Disease, yeah. And to what book are you reading right now? I would love to know what you're referencing in. Well, let's see, which one did I have? Uh, Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Insect and Disease Control. It's got lots of nice, good pictures. Oh, you can't read that, can you? That's a great book. Somewhat. Backwards. Okay. The Organic Gardener's Handbook of Natural Insect and Disease Control. And it's a Rodale Garden book. There's also another one. This is pretty good too. Insect Diseases and Weed Guide, ID Guide. Can you so, hold that book up please, Mary? I've changed yeah, the book okay. so people will see. I can send, I can put these in the chat if you want. Okay, and also the first book again, please. Well, I knew you could read Chinese, Michael, but uh, I didn't know you could read, read backwards. Backwards. I didn't know you could read backwards. Look at you. You, you look like a you look like QVC now with like QVC spelling out. I have one last question. So for like um, tomatoes and zucchinis and cucumbers, does anybody have like this weekly prevention application of anything or routine for disease or um, bug? application for prevention? Uh, for zucchinis, uh, what happens is that there are some things called squash borers. It's a little fly, a colorful fly. It's kind of orangey. And it lays the eggs on the bottom of the stem. They hatch, they dig into the stem, and they eat the inside of the stem. And eventually, the zucchini just collapses. It happens to other squashes as well, not just zucchini. Uh, the only thing that it, that doesn't happen to is butternuts because the butternuts have a hard enough stem that uh, the larva can't eat into the stem. Uh, that's why I grow butternuts and not the other squashes. Uh, but uh, one thing that you can try that is the uh, BT. It's a spray that kills caterpillars and presumably if you spray the BT around the base of the plant on the stems, when, they, when the eggs hatch, they have to, they, they'll wind up eating the BT as they bore into the stem and that should take care of them. I don't know if it really works. It's never worked for me, but that's what you're supposed to do. One of the things you can do as a preventative. 
uh, Bt is common and it's, it's an organic. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a bacteria. It's a bacteria. It's organic. Uh, you can get it at any, any uh, store that sells uh, fertilizers and insecticides yeah, and stuff. Okay, thank you. For squash borers, I don't know if anybody's tried this. I've recently seen where people take aluminum foil on the base of the plant, like right at, right where it touches the ground to keep them away from being able to bore inside. Has anybody tried that? I have tried that. Did it With work? Limited <laughs> success. It's, uh, it, it, it's been hard to keep up with it because uh, unless you wrap it really tightly, uh, it, you know, the plant grows and the wind blows. And, but um, I've also heard of using gauze. And I tried gauze one year. And uh, I think I just wasted a lot of gauze. <laughs> <laughs> I've also heard stockings. If you have any, any old stockings with runs in them, you can wind them around the stem. Yeah, there's other methods too. For example, if you see the hole where the borer is, if you take a, a thin wire, you can stick it up the stem and presumably uh, pierce them. Uh, or you can slit the stem uh, and, and get them out and then rebury the stem. That has never worked for me either. When I cut the stem and, the stem and bury it, the plant dies. So. <laughs> What I do really is I plant new uh, zucchini right around now. And by the time it starts to grow and I put it out, the uh, squash borers are gone. And then you get a second round of, of zucchini later in August. I've, I've done the surgery on the stems with limited success, but I use Bill's method also. I plant zucchinis usually in two to three plantings. And then when the first one's that is demise, they're ready, the next one's ready to produce. The surefire method. There you go. Safety in numbers. That's right. <laughs> I, have okay. a related, I have a related question about squash. How does this happen? You know, we, um, we tried to start a couple squash inside from this, uh, it's like an Asian squash. It's a, it's a winter squash. It's like the shape of a football, but a little bit bigger. Delicious flavor. Like we would, we would taste and think, hmm, what spice should we put with this? Oh, it's perfect just like this. Oh, such a delicious squash. So we planted some seed. You know, we tried to start some inside. And one, we were like really over aggressive and it was out way early. And, you know, it, it, that just got cream. But there was another one that would get started and put it out at the right time. And it's doing, you know, pretty well. And then I go over to this heap in my backyard where some compost was thrown and there's this ginormous squash plant. It's like taking over the backyard. And, you know, we, how does that work? How does that work? Volunteers always grow better than whatever, whatever you have in there, whatever's, whatever's already there. Will, will grow right. But you don't know what you're going to get. That's the thing. Yeah, it could not be the, the same thing that was grown previously. <clears throat> okay, well, I see we, I see we're about the half hour mark. Uh, I can share my screen to say that it's time for Bill and Steve to do their weekly update, or you could just start in with your updates. Go, go ahead. I'll follow you. Okay, mine is pretty simple this week. Uh, I didn't have to water. We, I had two rainstorms, uh, plenty of rain. Um, everything is mulched. I finished that. Um, what I've been doing is mainly dealing with insects this week, uh, mostly hand picking the first newcomers that, that enter the garden. And the new ones are cucumber beetles, uh, Japanese beetles today and yesterday, um, some potato beetles. Uh, and what I find, if you, if you get the first couple that, uh, that are, get to the garden, uh, you can delay their, their entry or perhaps get rid of them for the season uh, because there's only a limited number that hatch out at any given time. And uh, getting the ones before they, they multiply really makes a big difference in terms of what happens to the insect numbers. Uh, plus, by getting the first ones, you allow predator insects to catch up in their population, which can control, you know, them later on. So I've been doing that with a number of insects this uh, this week. 
and uh, then mostly just harvesting. Um, we've gotten just about everything at this point. Um, so that, that's about it. Do you use your fingers to squish them? Uh, oh, yes. I do. <laughs> I find it very yes. rewarding. And I know Michael Hill is probably thinking of me in a very negative way right now, but uh, these are not endangered insects. <laughs> and uh, no matter how many I get, believe me, there's plenty more. <laughs> so if you guys find any, just send them over to the Makowskis and they'll, 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 they'll squish them for you guys. I'm afraid Michael, Michael may be doing that already. He's taking his insects and sending them over here. <laughs> um, I just ran across something in this book again. It says you can use garlic spray for a range of fungal problems. Now, there's no recipe in here, but, you know, um, you might try that. With the leaf problems. Leaf problems, yeah. The, yeah, the fungal, fungus things. Okay, I think Steve, if you're ready to go. Sure. Um, I haven't had too much problems with bugs lately. Um, I don't know why, but Bill, you and I are not very far away, so <laughs> I'm hoping yours don't come my way. The one thing I have noticed, though, is uh, my collards have been susceptible to, um, to the cabbage worms, the cabbage white butterfly. So these are little butterflies. They're about an inch um, they're whitish yellow and they have a black spot on the wings and they're um, you'll see them fluttering around all the kind of coal crops the cabbage and the and the broccolis and, and things like that I keep a little um, uh, butterfly net in the garden and uh, try to sneak up on them because they're very wary and if, if you get too close to them they'll fly away and but uh, I dispatch them that way um, my apologies to Michael. And um, so that's that's been pretty successful in the past. Otherwise, I'm gonna keep an eye out. I have seen Japanese beetles. And today I actually saw a, um, I saw a lightning bug on my kale, which is the first time I ever saw that. And I just watched it for a while. It looked like it was just hanging out there waiting for it to get dark. So I'm not too worried about that. So my lightning round of uh, my, my vegetable garden is my beans, uh, my green beans are uh, just about flowering. Uh, peas, I'm still harvesting tons of peas. I'm staking my tomatoes. Squash are just going into flower. Potatoes are all flowering except for that one row and that's about to flower. Uh, my corn's about 12 to 14 inches high. I just side dressed it with uh, some organic fertilizer. Uh, my greens are on their third, third set, uh, lettuce, kale, collards. Uh, spinach is all done, but I've, I've, I do succession plantings of the other ones, and I've had a, it's been a great year for salad greens. Um, broccoli is just finished. Cauliflower is all starting. They're probably uh, baseball size right now. Um, I've been eating lots of blueberries. Um, Swiss chard, I just planted Swiss chard, so uh, they're only about two inches tall um, because I like to get them a little later in the season. Cucumbers are small, but they're starting to flower. And then I've got lots of flowers and um, I've got garlic that looks like it'll be ready to harvest in, within the next couple of weeks. That sounds very successful. Yeah, it's been a, a banner year, really. Yeah, it's been lots of sun. Uh, you water and it doesn't rain and uh, it's been cool so far. It hasn't been like 90, 95 days, not right. 50 days. So the plants are, are happy. Yeah. Sorry, I have a question with garlic. I have, I mean, do they always turn into scapes? Is that something that always happens? They curl and become yeah. garlic scapes? So I guess yeah, mine the, hard, not... the hard necks will all do that. Oh, okay. The scapes are really good, by the way. If you catch them early enough, you can snap them off and you saute them um, or, or blend them and make it like a garlic, um, kind of a garlic dressing. But I, I tend to, I tend to cut, you know, four or five, six inches of the scape and uh, just cut it into like one inch pieces and saute it and serve it like green beans. It's got a very sweet, mild garlic flavor. So, so again, how, how would I know, you know, right now my, my garlic doesn't seem to be curling that much, but I do have long stalks. Like how, how would, again, when would you know to, to harvest them or when they're done or if they're growing correctly? Yeah, well, I, I've already been harvesting all my scapes. So um, it's, a, it's um, I wouldn't be harvesting them this time 
because they're they're starting to harden off and then they become too tough. So as soon as they start coming up and they start bending a little bit, almost looks like a, a shepherd's crook, mm -hmm. um, at least the, the varieties that I grow. Um, you just you just kind of bend it and see if it snaps, almost like an asparagus. If it snaps, then you know it's it's ready. If it doesn't, then it's probably beyond its point and it's going to be too woody. But uh, so so as far as, so if, assuming I don't get scapes, when when would I actually harvest the actual garlic? Oh, when the leaves start turning brown, you should have like three three layers of leaves that are browning out. Usually going to be mid July to the end of July or early August. Thank you. That's been my experience. Yeah, I just read a good piece in the New York Times on Sunday. There's a garlic uh, commercial garlic grower, organic in uh, Washington, state of Washington, uh, and a whole piece on on garlic. The whole the whole article is on garlic. And what you want to do, I think, is dig up one of the garlics and make sure that it really is uh, to the point where it's done by looking at the shoulders of the garlic. If if it's kind of smooth. It's not ready yet, and you shouldn't dig up any more. But if it has shoulders on it, then it's probably ready. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was that was one of the things they said about it. And then after that, you need to uh, uh, harden them. Uh, well, you hang you you, you hang them in a cool, uh, sunless uh, place, and that's hard to find in most places in the summer. But I have a, a like a a porch and under the porch I hang them so they get plenty of air they're not in the sun but they're, they're in ambient ambient temperatures kind of and it seems to work yeah what what do you mean by shoulders um when the garlic comes up if it if, as it reaches the stem if, if it's if it it's supposed the garlic is supposed to come up and kind of turn a little bit so it has shoulders as it meets the stem that's what that's what they mean by the shoulders. If it's coming up and just going right into the stem, and it's smooth, you know, the, the garlic is smooth. It's not ready yet. So that's that's what the article said. Thank you. I've been making pesto from the garden of the scapes. By the way, I can't recommend it more. Do it. It's it's so amazing. And it's been keeping so well. It's like jazzing up every dish. I highly recommend it. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. So, Michael, you want to uh, shimmy or? Uh... Um, okay, let's let's briefly shimmy because uh, you know we're having a shorter session today. But yeah, uh, stand up and shimmy in place. We've been sheltering in place for a while, but stand up and just move a little bit. We're going to have to do it. We're going to have to call Tom after tomorrow, I think, to try to get it straightened. Yeah, something's very wrong, and it could be a virus. It could be something like that. I don't know. I don't know what's causing it. But it's not just I'm afraid reloading I'm, the. I'm afraid I might have done it by, by messing around with the top spider. Maybe, but maybe not. It just could I happen. shimmied and grabbed at the air. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I've been having the first pests that I'm seeing are on my Brussels sprouts. These little mm. wormy looking guys and they're made like they got one plant. It looks like it's been blown up with a shotgun. I can't believe how much damage they did so quickly. Making um, lots of little holes. Yeah, brassicas are tough, man. Yeah. Yeah. What are what are they on there? Any idea? Are they little caterpillars? Yeah, yeah, they're yes. Little stripy guys. Oh, I don't know if they're straight. They're so small. They're really slimy looking. Slimy looking. Yeah. Are they slugs? Could they be slugs? slugs? Well, Mary will come over and squish them for you. Maybe. I guess it could be a slug. I thought it was a cat. I mean, it's it's long and slimy looking. It could be a small slug. Uh, the big slugs are very very easy to identify, but little tiny slugs sometimes can uh, look like a long slimy worm because they stretch out. Do they uh, eat brassicas? They, they, eat everything. Eat, they eat everything, pretty much. <laughs> Damn slugs. They also like beer. Not my beer, no. <laughs> we, we used to take pie pans and put them at ground level and put a half a can of cheap beer in there and 
in the next morning it'd be fill, filled with slugs. I gotta try that. Cheap beer. Negro hostas, Not that's good. something you to do for hostas because they're slugs get your hostas and you put out beer underneath them. Put out a Corona. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I have more in common with slugs than I thought. They like that's beer right. and brassicas. <laughs> Well, you can you, know, you can cover those uh, with a a reme, you know, a fabric cover for a yeah. while to keep those things out of there. I mean, if, if it depends on what they are. If they're if they're um, caterpillars, they've come from moths and they would fly in there. But if they're slugs, they're coming up from the you know the ground. Mm -hmm. So then you'd have to do something else. You could try sluggo uh, around it and uh, see if that. Uh, get some of them. Um, I've been going around with actually getting big slugs lately. They're, they're devastating my brassicas. <laughs> and I go out at, if you go out at dusk, you can, they all come out. So if you wet the, the sprinkle your brassicas before dusk, they come out earlier. And this way in the light, you can actually go and throw them, I throw them in a, in a jar of salty water. Tell them what you use. <laughs> and to pick them up, they're so slimy. I uh, I use Mary's hat pin. <laughs> pick them up. It's a good thing I never throw anything out, right? Hat pin. It works for the big ones. It doesn't work for the little ones. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get back to the uh, agenda. Um, <laughs> Michael's getting disgusted here. I, I want every everyone should know, but about the Warwick Food Shed Locavores map. It's on the Sustainable Warwick website. Chad, in particular, has put a lot of work into it. It really is valuable. Anything you'd want to find that you're not growing in your own garden, if you don't find it on the map, then it's not available. Is that right, Pat? Something like that. There's really a lot of good stuff there. And yeah, really it's, on the, it's on the website. It's great. And I just want to mention, uh, Sean is a big part of it. He kind of, at a sustainable Warwick meeting, kind of motivated us to start looking at local people. So you you're, you kind of started the ball rolling, whether you know it or not. But yeah, it's, it's a great interactive map that um, you could look up Anything within a 25 mile radius of Warwick, uh, you know, different uh, CSAs, farmers markets, uh, farm stands, uh, grocers. So it's 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 great. It has a uh, if you click on it, has uh, all the, you know the stuff there that's available there, whether it be eggs, cheese, you know, you know, you pick, and uh, phone numbers, contact information. But we do uh, welcome if you do know of any others that we don't have on that list, please. There's a there's a email there that you could contact and we will update and we're you know looking for ways to really promote this map and we will do so but uh, it's very exciting thank you thank you for your for your work in putting that together that's a really uh, a great community uh, uh, community asset yeah. thanks so um, the other thing we wanted to have a discussion about was um, and my the other thing we want to have a discussion about or not a discussion but what topics do people want? The reason we're watching this thing about my Hugo Mount is because we didn't have anybody recommend a topic. Uh, although I do think the Hugo Mount thing is interesting. But um, what topics do people want to hear about or what do they want to present about in the next session? Uh, if people could just call them out and chat, if you could keep, keep notes on them. All right. I'm getting ready to plant my fall garden right now. So if we can talk about that within the next upcoming weeks, I think that that would be helpful. Right, because uh, uh, right, you guys. Every am, am I? I'm not alone here, right? Other people get ready to plant their full gardens too. Well, one thing you should be doing is starting some of the seeds for brassicas now mm -hmm. or last week even, because mm -hmm. uh, you want to put them out in in you know in middle end of July or even beginning of August, but not later than that. And they should be put out at a reasonable size. And because otherwise the, the insects love brassicas in the middle of the summer as they just demolish them. So you, you need to be getting those seeds going now. Okay. And we could, we, we could have a, uh, you know, a session on how to do that. Yeah, I would, I would love to talk. This is going to be the first time I'm planting a full garden, but the other thing too, that I think would be helpful. It's something I see other people, cause you guys know, I love me some YouTube for educational purposes. People I find are talking about planting things in certain seasons. And I think we touched on it briefly before, right? Cause Bill, you said like, you don't like planting zucchini now, but you'll get a really good harvest from it. And like bugs won't attack it so much later on. 
right, right? right so people are talking about maybe planting things at different times where you know that the insects aren't going to be so abundant at that time so if it, i don't know if we could get like some sort of timeline or an idea going of what's great for planting when to try to maybe not fight nature so much but work more in it mm -hmm. i think that that would be great yeah, I mean, there's a few things Sounds here good. Plants to do that, but I mean, basically, the, the plants have a desire for cool weather or hot weather, and that's what the, pretty much determines when you grow them. And uh, so the spring and the fall have a similar set of things that you can grow uh, because the weather is cool. And in the summer, you can only grow the things that like the hot weather. And uh, if your summer stuff isn't in now, it's getting, getting to be really late. Uh, but uh, we could go over the stuff that I plant in the fall or what anybody plants in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can do the same thing in, that you did in the spring, essentially. Yes, with like the exception of like spinach, right? No spinach right now for the summer? Is that true? Uh, spinach that. doesn't like the heat right now. Right. But if you can plant fall spinach, it's fine. Um, but when you say planting fall spinach, like... I think about a fall garden planting or thinking about getting ready now, right? Well, spinach, I don't think you want to plant now because right. it, 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 it's, it, it's a short, look at the time it takes for maturity. Uh, you could start the plants and figure out how long it's going to take to maturity. Uh, brassicas take a relatively long time, but spinach is short. Lettuce is short. And so you can start those much later in the, in the summer and get a fall crop. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of the brassicas, if you don't start them now, you know, what happens in the fall is there's less sun. And so even if it says 60 days, uh, you're not getting the same sun you would get in the spring when there's, you know, it, so the things come quicker in the spring. So you, you got to get them in early enough so that uh, you can, uh, you know, you can get the harvest before the, it gets too cold. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, one one topic I'd like to see, I don't know if I missed a couple of sessions, I don't know if you've covered this already, but just kind of a survey of organic fertilizers, what different people are using, uh, different formulas. I've, I've made my own uh, from a different couple of different formulas, and uh, so I'd be interested in what other people are using for organic fertilizer. Earlier on, I heard someone mention uh, watering. I think that was Nicole. Who, this was weeks ago. She mentioned something about watering and and um, uh, drip irrigation and stuff. That would be a good one for the list. And Bill mentioned something today. Bill mentioned something today about um, organic, organic uh, pest control. control. Uh, you know, different things you can use to deal with different kinds of bugs. I must have more bugs than anybody else. I have a lot of bugs. <laughs> oh, Bill, our garden has endless bugs. It's a constant battle. We're just lucky because there's a volunteer force to, to attack. Mm -hmm. Folks, we only have 10 minutes left. I'd like to just spend a little time on the Hugo Mound and what we did. Uh, so this is a common, very common thing in, in uh, like in, um, 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 I'm sorry, the um, permaculture. They're always talking about Hugo Mounds. So this was five years ago. May of 2015, we were building a pavilion in our backyard to have solar panels put in, and at the same time we had um, uh, the, the, our deer fence put up. So um, you can see this build, this equipment was here in, in, in the back here, uh, and, and the, Tom Waglin, who was doing the construction, said, well, while we're here, do you want us to dig any beds or anything? So I guess I thought this up in about five minutes, although maybe I thought about it in advance, but so he dug this pit, uh, is, I, I have here six feet wide by 20 feet long. I think it's actually wider than that. But you know, we are on the Western ridge of the Warwick Valley. If you stand, oh, if you go over to the um, Belleville Creamery and you look across the valley, we're sort of like on the top there. And so at one end of my yard, there's like this much topsoil before the rock begins. On the other side, there's maybe several feet. But I think that's sort of because we're sort of like the ridge of the valley. Maybe I'm wrong about why that is, but at all events, that's what our, my backyard's like. And so the pit he dug, two and a half feet was the deepest. And, but in some spots, it was only a foot and a half deep. And you can see there's a lot of rock in there. 
So with a Hewlett mound, you put like logs in the bottom. And um, you already know I live in Warwick and I'm in the town. So that means I have like two acres. Um, and half of it has to be covered with trees. You already know that, I don't have to explain. So they went out, so a couple of people were helping me and we went out in the woods and we found all these old logs and made the, the bottom layer. And uh, ran over them with a backhoe to sort of press them down. Uh, the Winslow Therapeutic Writing Center provided very quality material, uh, horse manure, to uh, help the logs in their development. Um, more logs and branches. And also you see the garden hose. Every time we put stuff in, we kept watering down. That's one of the instructions for when you make one of these things. Aged wood chips that came from uh, Acorn Tree Service, thanks to them. So as they were digging out the pit, they sort of separated the soil and, and the stone and they put some of the soil back on. And then branches of things, the trunks will, be, will become firewood. Thick layer of leaves, uh, more topsoil from the yard, the rest of the horse manure, layer of straw. So Hugel means actually, it's, I think it's uh, a German word or a Dutch word or something for mound. So it's Hugel mound translate to mound mound. Um, mixture of compost and horse manure top the straw. The sod that we pulled off went on upside down. A huge layer of compost that came from the village of Warwick, BPW. So you see how it's mounded up like that. And then at the very end, we put this, um, you know, out in the woods, there are these cedar borders and um, put this uh, straw around it for sort of the walkways around it. And this was ready to, to plant things in right away. Okay, so that's how it looked five years ago. And check it out, so the, 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 the deer fence had just gone in and check out those trees there. And after five years, this is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, note the size of the trees. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the prayer flags are there. But at this point, it's actually sort of sunken down. Um, I still maintain a walkway and I've mulched it with different things across the years. Um, at this end, I have this asparagus patch is like two or, this is the second year of that asparagus patch. I later, I decided I really wanted it to be for um, perennials. This is in permaculture terms, I think this would be my zone three. It's fairly far away from my house. What I heard when I did this was that the materials underneath as they broke down would act like a sponge and I would never need to water it. Um, I think I've been relying on that too much. I did go to watering some this year, but I do feel like I've got a big pit here. And so it's almost like I feel like I'm filling a bathtub or something that I'm, you know, I heavily soak it water deep and I don't have to do it very often. So last year we put in a second set of solar panels. Um, our first set, for people who don't know, our first set provided all of our electricity. And then a year and a half ago, we put in heat pumps. So instead of heating with fossil fuels, we heat with electricity. Once we found out how much we used, we knew how many solar panels we needed and we put them in. So this ground mount system, they had to dig a trench from this back to the house. Well, it went right through the Hugel Mound. <laughs> I, yeah, I you, we could have planned ahead uh, and it would have been different, but you know, this is four or five years later. And, and actually, if you see here, this stone here, this is where probably I planted this row of potatoes here right on where the trench really went and then my bridge should be over. Next year, I'll, I'll align my bridge with, with this. I take the bridge in during the winter. So pr may, I maybe put the bridge in the wrong place, but. I put um, potatoes on both sides that I'm hilling up. And this side has the um, um, 
uh, asparagus, and this has other things. But notice how, I mean, the bridges, those are straight boards, huh? And instead of being mounded up anymore, it is all really sunk down and, and collapsed. If, if um, and let's see, after listening to everyone on, on the Zoom, I went in and I cleared the weeds out really well, and this time I mulched it with wood chips. I also cleared out all of the old um, other things that I'd mulched with. Um, I don't plan to leave those wood chips there very long. Uh, at the end of the summer when I'm cleaning the, the asparagus out, I will, I will remove all of those too. Um, let's see. So on this end, like I said, a couple years ago, I decided I really wanted to make this a perennials bed. These are two hazelnut bushes. Uh, they haven't produced hazelnuts yet, but they're supposed to grow to a size of five feet tall by five feet wide. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. I've, I've got it like a red cabbage in there. I've got some uh, comfrey in different places. I've got a couple of gooseberries that you can't really see. And um, I think my wife put a squash plant here. We have back in here um, a number of sweet potatoes that are doing well. Last year we planted corn in here and it did great. Just about everything I've planted in here has done great. Uh, long, I'm, I'm trying to do better about keeping it mulched and keeping the weeds down. Um, um, I think that's the end of my I have show. a question, Michael. Yeah. Um, so I saw your Hugel Mound maybe three years ago when I was at your house for one of the dinners. Um, when in, in the first couple of years, do you need to pour a lot of water on it to, to get it to start, you know, doing whatever it does? Or, or do you just let the natural rainfall water it? Um, um, we, I, I didn't. Um, my wife accuses me of being a chronic underwaterer, though, so don't <laughs> listen to me. Um, um, when we put it in, we watered heavily. So yeah. it was supposed to be like, everything in there was supposed to be like, like waterlogged. Like body, and, yeah. yeah. And it, it never looked to me like the plants were wanting for water. Let me just put it that way. And, and when you do it, you're supposed to make it so that the top few inches are already good for planting things. So you plant things and, and, and as you nap, maybe you need a little bit of water for, you know, what's on top. And then, um, so then over time, the underneath gradually develops. Thanks. Do you do anything to winterize it? Do you plant like a cover crop in that area or add to it or anything? You, you, you know, one of the things you're supposed to do is like for all of your garden beds is like add a layer of compost. Like, wow, it's just the whole thing is just a layers of compost, right? And like, what am I gonna do? Put compost on my compost? So, um, but, but it is sinking down. So this gets me to thinking, well, you know, what should I be doing about it? And like I said, I, I actually, I haven't done an exhaustive study of this, but like if you go on YouTube, there are a lot of things about how to make a Hugel mound, but not what to do with it five years later when it's a Hugel ditch. <laughs> well, I was just thinking like, I know in my garden at the end of the season, when I'm cutting everything back, like I cut it and I drop it, right? So I'm, and the reason I say that is because a Hugel mound, I've always thought of it as like lasagna, right? It's that layering of different levels um, and then everything just composting and making beautiful, rich, fertile soil. So that's why I was asking like, what are you doing to like stop erosion, right? From happening over the months where nothing is happening on that. Or are you dropping any of your veggies oh, at the end of the season? Well, let's see. To help lift it again, you know? Especially since I first got, since I got this new invasion of asparagus beetles. I, I was in the past pretty good about, I like my brother's idea of sort of leave things in place and let the roots become worm chow. I, I like that idea. Uh, but I'm definitely going to give it up for my asparagus patch. Uh, those will be chopped down and take all the mulch out and put, but but definitely like a layer of leaf mulch is what I would be putting on there, at least. Now, now with the Hugel mound, I think that's just the nature of it. I think it, it probably just lasts. You have a big mound and then it, and it kind of kind of breaks down as you go. And right. I, I think so, that's, a, uh, you know, then it's still gonna be a very fertile spot, but then you might want to start another one, but I don't, I don't know if you can really build it back up. Again. When I go in there, in uh, like in the spring, if I want to, uh, you know, what Bill used the word crack the soil once, uh, he was showing me some things that you get in there and you sort of, I don't want really to turn the soil over, but crack it. I'm thinking, wow, this is like my own black dirt region. It's cool, cool. You know, it's like, 
oh, but the other thing, the other question I have that I wonder, um, I guess this would be for Brendan last week, who said he always sends off to have uh, um, soil tests done. Like my Hugo Mound is different from the raised bed, it's different from the sheep mulch area. I was like, they, I would have to like have 10 different soil tests for, you know, my garden. I mean, so what would anybody else do in the, along those lines? But when you're talking about a soil test, what are you talking about? You just want the pH or do you want something else? You want the, the... Well, uh, Brendan was talking about last week where he always sent away for, oh. um, he always sent away, he'd have a soil sample sent and then he paid 25 bucks and then and figure out what to supplement it with. We don't, we don't really do that regularly. We do test the pH uh, fairly often. Um, I think if you just keep adding organic matter to the soil, uh, you're going to be okay. And I just don't worry about the nutrient levels. And we do fertilize. When we put a plant in, for example, we fertilize. Uh, put some fertilizer in with it. I've got to jump off, guys. I'll see you all next time. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, it, it is nine. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate yeah, it. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. I'm going to uh, you, everyone. take that list of the uh, topics and we'll I'll send that to you, Michael. Okay. Thanks, okay. everyone. And take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. So what are you going to do, Michael? Are you going to try to just do some more research and figure out how to make the pit from sinking? Um, you know, the, oh, let's see, I'm going to stop recording at this point, just.